This old knife just doesn't cut it anymore. There's got to be something better. Now there is. Wow. The Come On Ceramic Knife. It never needs sharpening, and it's only $29.95. It really works. And if you order right now, we'll send you the matching paring knife and bread knife. Now that's a deal. And during this special offer, you'll also get our special cutting board, knife holder, and cleaning cloth with special Come On Cleaning Solution, good for your knives, counters, and laundry. This is amazing. We're not done yet. You'll also get the mixing bowl set, ice cream trays, an inflatable chair, glow sticks, a shower pen, fridge magnets, an ironing board with shirt rack, an electronic Sudoku puzzle generator, language translator, mouse pad, and a mascot outfit. I don't have room for all of this. We're also including a closet organizer, bags of some kind, large plastic geese, and a deluxe litter box. I don't have a cat. And today only, we're doubling the offer. I just need a knife. Order now from Come On Ceramic Knives, a subsidiary of Unwanted Merchandise Disposal Services. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> Man. You know, a recent study showed that uh, Americans walk on average 900 miles a year. That's a lot of miles. I think maybe I walk a few more than that, I'm not sure. Another study found that Americans drink on average 22 gallons of beer a year. Uh, that mean on, means on average Americans get about 41 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Makes you proud to be an American, don't it? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's a rebob. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, I think, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how many of you ever been uh, talked into buying something that you really don't want or need? Yeah, probably all of us have, haven't we? <laughs> don't you just hate it when that happens, you know? <laughs> I do, I'll tell you what, you wake up the next day with buyer's remorse going, what did I do that for, you know? Man, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hate myself in the morning. Uh, let me just welcome you to gracelife.tv, glad that you're here today. Uh, just glad that you turned aside here today to just be with us. Uh, thank you as well for all of you who are joining us online. You know, there we got people all over the United States and as well as around the world that are viewing us uh, online. So we're just glad to have you with us today as well. Thank you for being here. Um, in, we're talking today. We're beginning or continuing our series. It's actually week two of our series called Liberty Gibbet. Uh, that was a new word for me. How many was that? Was New York word for you? Okay, so I don't feel so stupid now. I had never heard that. Well, I don't know where I found it or I don't know. I just uh, saw it somewhere and I thought, well, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. And really, Liberty Gibbet just simply means somebody who's kind of uh, uh, air, kind of airheaded and more, more along the lines of being a gossip, you know, somebody who talks too much. Somebody just says too many things and you get, you know, you get in trouble. But I remember when I was a kid, my dad would tell me, you know, if I was trying to get out of trouble for something and I'd just start talking and telling, you know, whatever, and he said, just say, keep talking, keep talking, you know, because he knew the longer I talked, the deeper I got, and sure enough, you know. I don't think I learned that lesson very well. I still do that, you know. It's not a good thing. You know, but but actually uh, today and in this series we're talking about one one of the things that I think is is probably one of the most dangerous things that we have among us today. You know, one of the most dangerous things that we can do. One of the most one of the worst threats, probably worse than communism or you know a tsunami or you know even something like that. Uh, maybe even more attractive in that sense of the word than than a beautiful woman, if that's possible, because gossip is really attractive, isn't it? It is. It's attractive. Admit it. It's okay. Because it is attractive. I mean, there's a lot of things about gossip that can be pretty attractive and, and kind of get us, uh, you know, drawn in. And we may not even know we're doing it until it's too late. All different kinds of things that happen. And it's really, really dangerous. You know, uh, quite a number of years ago, uh, when I first moved to the El Paso area, um, I was headed on, getting on the freeway up around Vinton area, or actually Anthony area. And there was a guy on the side of the road uh, that was dressed in a really nice suit, you know, and he had uh, looked like really, really expensive low-top shoes on, which I wasn't used to. <laughs> I don't own a pair of shoes, haven't owned a pair of shoes, low-top shoes, in I don't know how many bazillion years. But, you know, he looked like a really, really clean-cut, fine kind of a man. So I thought, well, I just, he was on the an on-ramp. I thought, well, maybe I'll just stop and get this guy, you know. So I stopped, picked him up, and I hardly ever do, I mean, hardly ever do that. Matter of fact, I don't know if I ever have before. That was maybe be, may even be the first time. 
And so he started to tell me this story about his daughter being sick and in another city, I think it was Dallas or somewhere, and that he was a military doctor and had got, I don't know, all kind, you know, he gave me this really, really long story about all the things that were going on in his life and he was really honestly crying and having a hard time getting the words out and all those different kind of things and, and it was really tough. I really felt sorry for the guy and so, you know, he was trying to prove to me that he was really on the up and up. So he gave me his email address, he gave me his phone number, he gave me his full name, he gave me all those kind of things, and you know, and he wrote that stuff down for me and handed it to me, all those kind of things, and really the only thing he really needed was a, was a plane ticket out of El Paso uh, that cost $200, and that's really all he really needed. He just needed to get to where his daughter was because she was, a, you know, extremely ill, and there were all kinds of difficulties like that, so being the good Samaritan that I am, I took him all the way over to the airport from this side, and I got him that $200 that he needed for his plane ticket, and it was all a scam. Every last bit of it was. I, when I got home, I thought, well, I'll just check into this guy. I checked his email address. It was a bogus address. I called the phone number. There was no such phone number. <laughs> you know, all those, I, I checked the guy's name. He gave me his name, and I remembered I had it written down, all the kind of things. So I checked online for a name. There wasn't even anybody named that name, I guess. I don't know. At least not, not that I could find. So as, as embarrassing it is, as it is for me to tell you that story, I have been scammed by the best. You know, it cost me 200 bucks that I put on a credit card because I didn't have the money. You know, and he promised me that he would pay me back. I mean, he'd, all those kind of things. I mean, the guy was really, really honestly looked sincere. But I knew something was up when I took him to the airport and gave him the money and I saw him slip out the back door. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and being the, uh, the stupid hick that I am, uh, still am, I really was back then worse than I am now because I had never lived in the city in my life. You know, I'd always lived in the country and, you know, with just around a few people. And as most of you know, the place I came from only had 20 people, 21 people living in the city there. City, I, you noticed I said city. And uh, there was another city about three miles up the canyon that had 16 people that lived in that city. And I didn't live in either one of them. I lived between them. So, you know, I was really, I've been scammed by the best. And they, you know, there's people that sure enough do that. Um... Actually, the first known usage of the term con man, at least as far as I could find, was in 1849. And, and uh, it, was, it was in a newspaper when the press used that particular term, con man, because it was during the trial of William Thompson, a guy by the name of William Thompson. And William Thompson was a man who simply chatted with people on the street. You know, he just walked down the street and made friends with people. And, and as he chatted with them, he talked with them, walked along with them. And he gained their confidence until he gained their confidence enough and he said, can I borrow your watch? I really need a watch. Can I borrow your watch? I'll bring it right back. And he borrowed their watch, of course, never to return. And I don't know how many watches the guy ended up with, but that's, that was his scam. And he was a con artist. That's what he did. He was a confidence man. He gained their confidence once he gained their confidence, then he got, that, got them to give him what he wanted. And once they gave him what he wanted, he just disappeared. You know, so that's actually where that con man or confidence man term came from. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's as embarrassing as I said it is for me to admit that I've been, you know, swindled by the best out of, you know, that 200 bucks. Paul says that this other kind of person, the other person we're talking about here, the kind of people we're talking about here, are even more dangerous than that, you know. They're actually much worse than even the slickest con man. That type of person that, you know, that... Uh, who's not interested in your money uh, necessarily. And, and, but they are in your confidence. They certainly want your confidence and your confidence in them or, or the lack thereof. So Paul says that we need to keep our eyes open. We need to stay away from them. We need to keep away from them because gossip, those who spread gossip, not, will not only literally destroy a church but I can attest to the fact, because I've lived there before, that, a, that gossip can destroy an entire community. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. It can destroy an entire community to where there just isn't anything else left. I'll tell you what, um, <clears throat> where I came from, when I came from, from uh, to, to when I moved here, 
uh, literally the only people at that particular point in time that were welcome in that community were people who were related to other people in the community. I was the only, my family, me and my family were the only people that weren't related to anybody else there. So, and, and I, well, I actually shouldn't, shouldn't say that. There was one other uh, lady that wasn't related to anybody there, and she had been there as a school teacher and retired, and she was there, had been there for like 20 or 25 years, and she still said that she was not accepted as part of that, that community. So, you know, <clears throat> and so the only person that we could talk about was ourselves. You know, I, we could, I could talk about her and she could talk about me, but we couldn't talk about anybody else, you know, <laughs> or at least not to anybody else because the story would sure enough get around. And, it, and, and that's exactly what happens in those communities is that there's people that, that you know, they eventually can run you out because you're the only outsider in the whole, whole community. So <clears throat> gossip is a really severe and really serious problem. And Paul says we need to be very, very careful because not only can that destroy your life, not only can it destroy the, uh, an entire church, but it can literally destroy an entire community. So it, se okay, so it seems to me that the worst part of Paul's warning here in Romans is that, a per that the person he says we need to watch out for probably are not what we would consider to be strangers. And that's really the draw in gossip itself, is that the people are much, much closer to you than you would even want to admit to. As a matter of fact, when it's really serious and those kind of things, is that the people who are in, on the inside are those who are the closest of friends. As I mentioned before, actually family, actually related to each other. And that's, that's part of the draw, and that's part of the allure, and that's, part of the, that's what makes it so, so dangerous for us as well, is because... Uh, they operate within the, the, uh, the friendship ring, not outside of that necessarily. By, you know, and, and, you know, we might think that the worst people in churches or worst people in the community we might think would be people who, you know, throw a wall-eyed fit and want their way. Well, well, no, you already know who those people are. Or you might think the really worst person that you can think of is a person who cusses you out to your face, you know, and talks bad about you in public and makes it really clear that they don't like you. Well, no, you already know who they are too as, as well, right? That's not so hard. You, you can kind of handle that. You know who they are and you know they don't like you. The problem is, is that the, that the gossip does this behind the scenes where you don't ever know what's going on. You don't ever know what they're saying about you until it's too late. So, so instead, Paul talks about in Romans 16, those who are talking privately about things within the personal lives of others, including yours, uh, that they would never say openly. I think you already know that. Things that they would never say openly, they'll say privately. You know, gossip. That's just a simple fact of the matter. Now, you remember that I, we talked about last week that Solomon identifies, actually, he says there are six things. No, there are seven things that, that the Lord hates, that God hates. Now, can you imagine God hating anything? <laughs> you know, it's not nice to hate. Were you ever told that when you was a kid? No, you can't hate. You might dislike somebody a whole lot. Well, okay, I dislike them <laughs> immensely. Does that count? <laughs> you know, no, I, you know, no it, you can hate things. I mean, that's all right. And, God, and of course, God being a righteous God and uh, those kind of things. But it says there's six things. No, there's seven things that, that God hates. And the worst one, of course, we already talked about last week, is the fact that what Solomon is doing there is using a literary device by which he uses the seventh thing to actually emphasize that and say that actually is number one. That's the worst thing, right? He said there's six things. He wasn't forgetful. He didn't happen to remember the last thing, at the, you know, seventh thing at the last moment. No, it's a literary device by which he says, here is the worst of the worst. There's six things, but yet there's one that God really, really hates the worst of all. And he says that is the one who creates di dissension or causes difficulty or causes division within the church or within a community. One who spreads strife among the brothers. It's a serious thing. Um, and that's that activity that God hates more than anything else. And I can tell you what, uh, being on the, on the outside or the inside, whichever way is more correct, of the gossip chain, especially in a place of leadership, I can guarantee you that's one thing that I, I personally detest. I just don't put up with it. And, and the problem is, is that 
they are the, the, the they in, in, in that Paul talks about are those people who confide in you about something that places, um, you know, uh, a suspicion or whatever on the character or the motivation of another. They may not say it directly, but it just places suspicion on somebody else. Maybe it's over the phone. Um, maybe it's while you're at the, at the cafe or you're enjoying you're join a cup of coffee in the Barn and Coffee Saloon, whatever. But I can guarantee you that they will rarely, if ever, uh, put that information in a text or in an e email or on a written note of any kind, at least not with their name on it. <laughs> it was kind of interesting because <clears throat> I was, while I was eating breakfast this morning, I had the TV on and Gilligan's Island was on. I, I kind of like Gilligan's Island. I don't know. It, uh, it's just kind of one of those silly things that I kind of like. And there was, and and the and the thing what was going on there is that there was a there was a guy that was uh, kidnapping people on the island. Well, where did he come from, right? <laughs> you all know who Gill Gilligan's Gilligan's Island is. And anyway, and so Gilligan was talking about the fact that you know that that, that they that the guy was leaving notes to to uh, to kidnap somebody. You know, so they want ten thousand dollars for this person and fifteen thousand dollars for that person, and so on and so forth. Of course, Gilligan's question was, did they sign it? <laughs> you know, Skipper looks at him like, duh. Nobody signs a note that says they want, you know, they want ten thousand dollars for whatever. You know, that's not that's not going to happen. They're not going to put their name on there. They don't want you to know who they are. Same thing is with gossip. As people don't want want you to know who they are. As a matter of fact, there's more insidious things that are taking place there. So the thing that makes the go makes gossip so alluring and so enticing, I think, uh, to those of us who would never participate in such activity is that it feels so good, Here, here's the draw, is that it feels so good to know that they have enough confidence in me to confide this information in me, right? That's what makes it so alluring, is because somebody else trusts you enough to give you information that is completely supposed to be totally private, right? Uh, yeah, it, it feels good. Uh, somebody asked you this question how many of you ever said something to your to your uh, better half your wife or your husband that uh, you would never say in public and then you turn around and one of the kids uh, just blurts it out have you ever had that happen <laughs> it's fun ain't it yeah <laughs> it's just great you know you say something privately to your wife and then the next thing you know the kids are, are spouting it off in public you know wow I'll I tell you what um, <laughs> I heard a, I heard about a, a young couple who had invited an elder. I told you this before. I'm gonna tell you again because I like it. An elderly pastor over for lunch one day, and and uh, wow. So after church, after church on Sunday morning, they were sitting in the living room, and the little boy was there in the living room playing with his toys and whatever, and you know, and and mom and dad were in the kitchen, kind of getting stuff ready and setting the table and all that kind of stuff, you know, getting ready for that. And and so the little boy said, yeah, yeah, hey, do you know what we're having for lunch today? And he said, no, no. He said, are we having, you know, steak or what? No, 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 no. Uh -uh. He said, no, we're having goat. We're having old goat. So are you sure we're having old goat? You know, that doesn't sound very enticing, but are you sure we're having old goat? He said, yeah. <laughs> I heard mom say to dad this morning, we're going to we just well have the old goat for lunch today as any other day. You know, so. Uh, it does get around, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, you got to be super careful, you know. Uh, it 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 happens. Kids will just tell anything. I, I'm at, how many of you are school teachers? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, so even though those who spread gossip often will rely on the greed and the dishonesty of those that they're talking to, because I think they like to receive gossip at least as much as they like to pass it on, right? A person who likes gossip likes to receive it as much as they like to pass it on. However, I think there's a more insidious side to this issue than even that. Uh, I think there's a side to this whole gossip issue that's probably of greater danger, maybe of greatest danger to those of us who are, especially to those of us who are really trying to be honest. Okay, so... so 
I know you all are trying to be honest, so put yourself in that, in that category, and I'm going to tell you that there is something here that is even more insidious than the things we've already talked about. In my opinion, the true gossip, one who is, is really uh, knows what they're doing, if that's a possibility of saying that, um, very often literally depends upon your honesty and your integrity, uh, especially for those of us who refuse to participate. They are depending on your honesty and your integrity. Let me explain what I mean. Uh, many years ago, there was a lady in a church that I pastored who, who had, uh, I, I got stopped by to visit her one day, and, 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 and while I was visiting with her uh, on, out there on her, at her front gate, and uh, she confided in me a piece of information that I didn't think anybody knew. You know, nobody knew. I didn't know anybody even knew about that particular situation. However, the information that she gave me was erroneous. It was wrong. So what I did was to begin to, to, because honesty and integrity, I said, you know what, we need to nip this thing in the bud, put it to a stop now, right? So the very first thing I did was to tell her, listen, your information is not correct and you need to just stop passing that stuff on. You know, and I said, here's really what's going on here so that you know, and you need to be, you know, be careful not to do, you know, not to, not to spread the false stuff because it's just flat not true. And while I was telling her those things, I began to get the idea that she knew way more. As a matter of fact, she began to correct me on some things that I had wrong, at least maybe not wrong and including, up to and including some things that I didn't think anybody else knew except me and the person it belonged to. Do you see what she did? She gave me a purposely false piece of information. She knew it was false. And she knew, since she knew I was a man of integrity, she gave me false information knowing that I would correct her and then she would be able to gain more information from me than even she knew she was hoping for, right? You see how insidious this is? Do you see how, what the, how great this problem is, how deep it goes? I mean, talk about uh, subversive, right? To give you a, a specifically knowingly false inf information, knowing that you're going to correct her and give her more information that maybe some things that she didn't know about so she could go ahead and continue her, her gossip chain as well. Uh, so you need to know right up front, you need to know right up front that there is, there's nothing that a gossip won't try to get you to fall into their trap, uh, trap and to assist them in their destructive, subversive, activity. And I'm telling you that because just like that guy that, 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 that sucked $200 out of me, as far as I could tell, he was the most honest man on the face of this earth. Right? Uh, same thing with a gossip. I guarantee you people will seem to be the most honest people on the face of this earth and yet they can suck you in and all of a sudden, you're part of the problem, <laughs> not part of the solution. <laughs> so what should we do when somebody comes to us with a choice bit of private information? Well, Paul says, the first thing we need to do, just simply stay away from them, you know? Uh, well, why? Well, because anything you say not only can, but will be used against you. Anything you say. I think you've probably had, all had difficulties in your life and found where people send you an email, they want a response. Maybe it's a friend, maybe it's a relative, uh, maybe it's a family member, you know, and they'll send you, send you, a, you know, a letter or whatever, email, whatever. And if you respond, if you respond in any way, all it does is give them inroads to respond back to you with greater problems, right? More accusations, more difficulties, all that kind of stuff. So, not responding at all is probably a good thing. Don't even respond. Don't say anything. Because I'll tell you what, they will, they will not only use that against you, uh, but 
but you'll become part of the problem in the dissension and all those, creating the controversy and all those kind of things. Okay, so here's a question I began to ask myself when I looked at this particular subject. I mean, why did Paul say that they were doing things that are contrary to the teaching which you have learned? Look at it. He says, now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on those who cause dissension and hindrances. That's what we've been talking about, right? Contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. The question I began to ask myself was, is that what is this contrary teaching to what you have learned? I mean, at first glance, it looks like Paul is simply talking about false teachers. Somebody who's spreading a false gospel. Well... Okay, uh, that works, uh, except that, you know, in my mind, at least what I was thinking about, first of all, were those who were teaching a gospel that was contrary to what I call Big G Grace. You all know, what I, most of you know what I'm talking about when I talk about Big G Grace. Everybody talks about grace. Everybody talks about grace. Big G Grace is something totally different. That's way beyond anything that anybody else could possibly imagine as far as grace is concerned. So, uh, that was the first thing that crossed my mind is, well, maybe that's what Paul's talking about. Well, the other question is that, well, what teaching have we learned then, right? What is it that we know about Jesus that will help us to understand what's going on here as far as these people who cause dissension and hindrances within the church or within the community? Well, first of all, the, the fact that it is the first thing that we need to know and the first thing that, that, ha that comes to my mind as far as the teaching that is contrary to what you have learned is that within this whole gossip idea, right, the whole dissension, hindrances, problem within the church or within the community, because every time a gossip talks about somebody else, it's about something that somebody else did that was wrong. They're sinful people, they've done this wrong, they're not good, you know, they, their motivation, whatever, all those different kind of things. Well, so the question is, what have we learned then? What is the teaching that we have learned? What is it that Paul has told us and, 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 and Jesus taught within his ministry? Well, the first thing is that it's not about sin to begin with, right? It's... Keep us in mind, I know you may be just a little bit lost at the moment, that's okay. It's not about sin to begin with. Our sins are not what's standing between us and God to begin with. Meaning that, no matter what someone else might have done or be doing that we think might be sinful, God isn't holding our sins against us anyway. It's not about sin to begin with. So the gossip, or to spread things about somebody else, to talk about what somebody else is doing in their life that we think is wrong, <laughs> it's like sticking your foot in your mouth. You know? It's, it's like when you use kids, they say, well, whenever you're pointing at somebody else, you've got three fingers pointing back at yourself. Okay, that's exactly right. You're going to try to take the log out of your, out of your the splinter out of your neighbor's eye, but, but Jesus said, but what about the log that's in your eye, Right? the same issue, the same issue. And that's exactly what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 18 19. He says, now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Remember? Not condemnation. And that's what our world does. That's what religion does. It's condemn you for your sin. Paul says, no, it's the measure of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling who? The world. the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation, not condemnation. What is gossip? Condemnation. Always. Always. When you say something nice about somebody, they say, oh. I wouldn't be spreading gossip like that. Well, well, it's not gossip then, is it? If you're saying something nice about somebody, it's not gossip. Gossip is only on the other side of the fence. It's condemnation. And Paul says that this is what we've learned, that it's not about the sins issue. It's about whether we have life in us, whether we, whether we possess His life within us. So it doesn't matter whether another person possesses Christ's life within them or not. Sins aren't the issue anyway. 
So how can you talk about their sins when sins aren't the issue in their life or in yours? <laughs> Am I getting through? Cool. All right, good. Good. So the opposite of reconciliation then is condemnation, and that's what gossip is. Tearing other people down, casting suspicion on the character of someone else, simply because you think that what they're doing is sin, as if I'm so perfect. No, as if sins were the issue to begin with. What difference does it make? I was raised to believe very strongly that even having a deck of cards in the house was sin. <laughs> Going to the movies is sin. Alcohol in any form is sin. Even though we were fed, uh, fed uh, cough syrup when we were kids. <laughs> oh, but you, you know, uh, uh, no, no, no alcohol in the house at all. You know, all those kind of things. So, you know what I'm talking about is that, uh, oh, dancing is sin, right? Uh, premarital sex, of course, is sin. Because we all know that premarital sex might, sin, sex might, might lead to dancing. And that's even, I mean, that's really bad. <laughs> We can't have that. You know, good grief. So, so Paul says, uh, uh, Paul says about our judgment of others in, cha in Romans chapter 14 and 4, he says, Who are you to judge the servant of another? Who do you think you are? To his own master he stands or falls. And what I'm talking about here is the things that, that I think that you're doing that are wrong <laughs> may not be wrong at all. As it, and the baseline is, sins ain't the issue anyhow. So what difference does it make, right? To his own master he stands or falls and uh -huh, stand he will, he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. Yeah, that's what it's about. That's what it's about. It's not about our condemnation or our putting others down or those kind of things because not only is sin not the issue to begin with, but just because I was raised to believe sin, uh, that dancing is sin doesn't mean you were. Is dancing sin? I don't think so. Is drinking sin? I don't think so. Is smoking sin? I don't think so. I don't find any place in the Bible that says any of those things. Matter of fact, as you all well know, Jesus' first miracle was turning water into wine, and he was good at it. <laughs> They said so. They said, wow, this is the good stuff. <laughs> you know? Okay, great. Uh, so, so why would anyone want to gossip about another then? I mean, what kind of person would knowingly destroy the lives of others? Well, Paul actually says in verse 18, he says, because they are serving their own appetites, their own fleshly self-serving appetites and that what's that's what well what fleshly appetite are they serving that's the question well our appetite for personal power and importance remember we began by saying it makes us feel really good when somebody confides in us a private piece of information right that's a fleshly appetite when we begin to think well I'm just so important you know uh, it serves our own fleshly and self-serving appetites by making me be a part of everything without actually having to do anything. <laughs> Listen, I highly doubt that any of you here today would ever willingly participate in gossip. That's not the issue. <laughs> and no, you know, I bet some of you are sitting back going, I wonder if there's a gossip problem in the church we just haven't been told. Is that why the preacher is preaching on gossip today? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's why this was a good time to talk about gossip. Because <laughs> there isn't. And there hasn't been for a long, long time. Uh, I, I, I just don't put up with it. And I know that the, the leadership doesn't either. So, uh, you know, that's not, it. that's not it. So put that out of your head if that's what you're thinking. I doubt that, that you would knowingly be part of something that God has directly said that he hates worse than anything else. And I don't think Paul is accusing us or expecting or thinking that we're doing that either because in verse 18 he says, For such people are slaves not of our Lord Christ but of, of their own appetites 
and by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. You are no longer unsuspecting if you were before. Because <laughs> we've talked about it, right? We've talked about baseline is the sins aren't the issue anyway, people. You know, so, so why bother talking about the sins of somebody else when that's not what the issue is anyway, you know? But the point is, Paul says, watch out. They're slick. You know, they're slick. I don't care who you are. They can fool the best of us and draw us into their trap. So Paul says, first thing, turn away from them. Refuse to be a part of their sub 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 subversive activity, and that's what it is. Just like that lady used that subversive activity against me, and it worked very well. <laughs> and once I found out what she was doing, man, it pissed me off. Whew, I've got over it. So, so don't try it again, because I'm, I'm ready now. I think, I, you know, no, probably not, but you know how I'm saying. So let me, let me just uh, end with this. Whoever gossips to you will gossip about you. Whoever gossips to you will gossip about you. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> I just love it how God gives us all this good information so that we kind of have our heads above water and got our eyes wide open and don't get caught with stuff like this. It's good. God's awesome. And he wants our lives to be blessed by saying, listen, here's where it's at. Keep your eyes open. <laughs> Keep your eyes open. So you don't get caught up in that as well, too. God's awesome. Lord bless you all. Amen. Give God a hand.